First, we'd like to wish all of our mothers a happy Mother's Day. Should really be honored every day, but today at least is is your day. You're the ones that take care of us, and as mothers and wives, you're you're the ones that make us look good. Speaking on behalf of the men, it's hard to begin today without kind of addressing what's been going on in our society over the past week. There's been a lot of social chaos, a lot of things in the media, a lot of a lot of things coming left and right, people becoming frantic, yelling about rights, equality, privacy, and it's all having to deal with the issue of abortion, legalization of abortion, and what have you, and all these discussions about when does life begin, and what is a human, and when is a human a human, conflicting legal definitions, and various other things. It's in this context that we just need to pause for a minute and kind of revisit, revisit why we believe what we believe. In many ways, as Christians, we're not, we're not completely interested in ethics, laws, or morality, because we have a higher constitution, we have a higher law. Everything else is measured in accordance to that, to that law, that gospel. When we tune out all of the chatter and all of the red herrings, because there's a lot of red herrings when it comes to this issue, there's a lot of discussions and side discussions that don't really have to do with the issue at hand. When you do away with all of the talk about rights and equality and privacy and all of that material, it boils down to a very very simple question, because we have two parties, one party advocating life, the other party advocating death. It's that simple. It's that straightforward. It's that fundamental. Beyond even going into much of a discussion, we have to ask if Christ, Christ will be with us on the altar and he is with us in our midst to, uh, right now. We ask him, Christ, which party do you support? The one for life or the one for that? The answer there is painfully clear. It is obvious. It is incredibly obvious. Now, some might be thinking, well, Archie, this is the way that you structured the question. because This is how we're programmed to think. You have a survey and you don't like the results. Well, the problem is with the question. It's not with the result. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, if that is the thought that popped into any of your heads, uh, feel free to rephrase that question any which way you want, in which the answer, the answer to that question is going to be different. When we pose the question to the one we call the king of life, the one who starts off the gospel of this morning telling us that he is the bread of life, the one who is life and resurrection. And we ask him, do you support the party that advocates for life or the one that advocates for death? You can rephrase that however many ways. The answer is not going to be changed because at no point will the Lord of life say death. Some, some thing that, you know, you don't like to follow what the church teaches. The first question there is, where did the church get its answer from? From the Bible. Straight from the Bible. This is, this really is not vague, gray, or controversial within the history of the church or the, or the interpretation of the Bible. Some may argue, well, I, I disagree with it, but I don't want to force my morality on others. The problem with this issue is that somebody's morality is going to win out. And not only that, if you're not going to force your morality on somebody, 
Well, that is the fundamental principle of law, that you are telling people how to act. This is as old as humanity. This is as old as the first law ever written. This is true with every single law we have today. Law is fundamentally telling people what they can and cannot, cannot do. For us, the issue is simple. Humanity is created in the image and likeness of God. We are a special creation different than anything and everything else. That's why God has given us authority, has given us responsibility. And with the authority and the responsibility, he has given this to us over everything, absolutely everything, except ourselves. That is the one era. It's the one issue that we do not have, we do not have authority. And the church, Christianity, has been very, very consistent on this for the past 2,000 years. If you think our stance is unpopular today, you should, have, you should look back, back in the good old days. In the Roman Empire, Christianity is a very small, meager, marginal religion, 1%, 2% of the population when you're lucky. And yet, consistently, against everything normal, ethical, legal, moral within that, within Roman society. Within Roman society, abortion was completely neutral. The Romans didn't really care one way or another because we have their laws, we have their medical texts, we know how they viewed these issues. For them, uh, rather not abort, but not a problem. There's no stigma with it. There's no problem with it. From the get-go, the church says, no, no, this is, this is sinful. You have authority every, over everything. We can put dogs down. We can put cows down. We can do whatever we want. We have that authority, except when it comes to human life. That is where God draws, draws the line. Then the Roman Empire, it was legal, it was ethical, it was completely acceptable to commit suicide. Some Romans actually viewed this as an honorable deed. A father, a father was completely within his legal and moral rights to command the son to commit suicide. And that son, if he was a good son, out of his duty to his father, he would commit suicide on the spot. History sometimes is more bizarre than fiction. But that was the norm within the Roman Empire. This is the norm that the early Christians came into. This is the social and religious context. And yet, Again, he said, no, absolutely not. We have control over everything except our lives. The practice of exposure. This is universal. Whether you're looking at Japan, whether you're looking at England, whether you're looking at the Americas prior to Columbus, it's universal. You had a child. You don't want the child for any reason, legally, religiously, morally, perfectly acceptable to just leave them by the side of the road, to leave them in the middle of the forest, to leave them in the middle of nowhere. You don't kill them, per se, but you just leave them. And you can imagine a newborn baby doesn't do well in the middle of a German forest in the middle of the night. Christianity comes along and says, no. No, because that infant has the image and likeness of God. We have authority over everything, except when it comes to those who have the image and likeness of God. Where does this consistently, consistency come from? 2,000 years of clear consistency. Well, because it's, when you look at the scriptures, it's not really a difficult question. It becomes difficult for us because we are bombarded with a society and a culture that keeps on telling us otherwise. Scripturally, it's not really all that difficult. 
if we're we're going to sit around and, and discuss the economic double procession of the spirit versus the single ontological procession of the spirit, then yeah, we're going to need to pull up a chair, we're going to need to get our notes, get a couple of really tall vanilla lattes, and we're going to spend a lot of time discussing this. That's complicated. That's difficult. When we speak about life, human life, in the scriptures, that's not at all difficult. Very beginning, Exodus. In Exodus, where there is any harm to a woman who is pregnant and the fetus is harmed. It's a life for life. We leave the Old Testament. We're, we're in the grace of the New Testament. In the grace of the New Testament, when you look at the word for fetus, for infant, and for child, the same word can be used clearly for all three. Whether you're looking at Jeremiah, speaking about how he was selected, before, before his birth, Isaiah, Isaiah 49, same thing. St. Paul in Galatians, same thing. When we are formed, we are called, we are in God's presence. We carry the image from the moment we come into the world. It is that simple. It is a choice between the faction that supports life and the faction that doesn't. Everything else, everything else is completely secondary and much of it, much of it is just a red herring that is attracting our attention and getting us involved in long-winded conversations and discussions that have nothing to do with the core issue, the core principle. As we speak about life, this period that we are in, Pentecost. Pentecost is a wonderful period because we are, the church is trying to get us to understand a whole bunch of things. The grace of the Spirit, the coming, preparing us for the coming of the Spirit. But also this resurrection, life, this eternal life and resurrection that we are, we are promised. You'll see that this comes up over and over and over again. The gospel of this morning, eternal life, and Christ aiding those who come to him, he will rise them again at the last day. That comes up four times. And it comes up again in the Catholic epistle. This is, this is not by accident. This is God trying to get us understand this glorious thing that, it, that is the resurrection. In many ways, even though we discuss the resurrection frequently and often, our discussions are kind of clinical. It's, what is the resurrection? Well, you rise again. Okay. Then what? What happens? And in, despite the multiplicity of ways that the scriptures try to get us to understand this, we're still kind of stuck on one hand because we still have death as something of a, of a filter. We still get stuck on the point of death and in many ways, once we are stuck at the point of death, it mutes, it dulls our understanding of the resurrection. I imagine, I imagine that God speaking us about the resurrection is a lot like if we were able to speak to a caterpillar about becoming a butterfly. There's a lot of similarities. You go to a caterpillar, you tell him, Mr. Caterpillar, I have great news for you. Right now you're kind of living a, a dreary life. It's the only life you know. But soon you're going to form into a chrysalis. And it's going to look like you're dead, but you're not really dead. You're going to be transformed. And you're going to become something remarkable. You're going to become something fantastic. You will emerge something, something glorious. Mr. Caterpillar, now, now, I, I hate to, to say this to you, but you're kind of ugly. You're kind of ugly, and you're a pest. When gardeners, when farmers see you, the first thought coming into their mind is, where is my pesticide? There is no love lost for you, Mr. Caterpillar. But then, 
then once you go through that transformation, you are going to emerge in vibrant colors. You're going to be viewed as the manifestation, the physical manifestation of beauty. Farmers and gardeners who previously reached for their pesticide, they're going to, they're going to rejoice. Because when they see you in their fields, they're going, to, they're going to interpret this as a good omen. This is a good omen that they are going to have a plentiful, rich crop. Mr. Caterpillar, right now, right now you're kind of confined to constantly eating bitter, bitter leaves. The only good leaves are the ones who are less bitter than the others, but they're all bitter. And you're constantly stuck on eating these bitter leaves. But after your change, after your metamorphosis, you're, you're, you're going to be living off a of sweet nectar. Sweet nectar, you're never going to have to eat anything bitter ever again. Mr. Caterpillar, right now you got six eyes, and but, but you're still blind. None of them really work. They're kind of there for show more than anything. Now, after your transformation, you're going to have two eyes, but you're going to have two remarkable, remarkable eyes. You are going to see in the entire spectrum of color. You're going to see in fantastic ways that you can't even understand now. Now, Mr. Caterpillar, I don't want to get technical with you, but the, the humans, the ones that we kind of set as the top of the pyramid, all of the color they see, all of the shades, all of the fine distinctions they can make with their eyes, that's because they have four different types of receptors in their eyes. You, Mr. Caterpillar, once you go through your transformation, you're going to have upwards of 15. You're going to see in ways that even the humans right now can't even understand. They can't even grasp. And with seeing being understanding, you're not only going to see differently, but you're going to understand it. You're going to see everything around you in a different context, and you're going to understand everything around you in a fundamentally different context. Right now, you barely move an inch at a time, and you're sluggish, and you're slow. But afterwards, you're going to be graceful. You're going to be light. You're going to be graceful. You will move great distances at an instant. What do you have to say about all of this good news, Mr. Caterpillar? What do you think about all of this great things that's going to happen? Unfortunately, like us, the caterpillar is going to stop, pause, look back at you, and is going to ask you, uh, Chrysalis, is that with the C or a K? Well, it, it, it's a C, Mr. Caterpillar, but you're kind of missing the point. You're kind of missing the point. It's not about the chrysalis. It's about the glory that will, you will become afterwards. Great, great. Thanks for sharing that with me, but... Uh, so this chrysalis, is it going to be dark colored or bright colored? What color is the chrysalis? Mr. Caterpillar, you are missing the whole point. It's not about the chrysalis. It's about what you will become after the chrysalis. And from that point on, when we speak about the resurrection, we are often tied into thinking about the chrysalis. We are thinking about this moment of death. Oftentimes, the departure, the sorrow, we are not thinking about what we will become. And the promises, the promises that will be fulfilled in us, that we will become, that we will become as he is, and that we'll be transformed into that glorious body that he has, that we will become beautiful, immortal, and incorruptible. And glory be to God forever.